Karen Bissow is with us now, one of two Republicans challenging incumbent Janet Dupree for the 115th Assembly District, the new 115th Assembly District. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. You were briefly in politics two years ago. Mm -hmm. You filed papers and, and considered running for the U.S. Senate, but mm -hmm. this is really your first real run uh, in politics. Yes. So tell us why you're running for the Assembly. Well, I'm running for the Assembly because people are tired of spin, buzzwords, and deflection. And that's what I've heard over the last two years. I spent about a year um, spearheading an organization called Team Watch. And Team Watch was responsible for following the words and the actions of their elected officials. So our elected official in the area, our congressional official, was Congressman Bill Owens. Mm -hmm. And so for a year, I tried to, or I participated and spearheaded. I was a lead facilitator for Team Watch for the 23rd Congressional District. And so what we did was we partnered his words and his actions, and we followed in trace back all of his pieces of legislation and through through that process and that was a very nonpartisan process we tried to really take a look at our elected officials so in doing that I had a wonderful opportunity to speak with a ton of people across the state of New York find out what makes them tick, the things that keep them up at night. And in doing that also, I got an opportunity to speak with a lot of local area people. Um, we, we spent a lot of time canvassing the area, speaking with people about the issues. And so I heard all of these concerns over and over and over again. At the same time, I tried to kind of craft a plan for how do we get good public servants out of their comfort zone and have them present themselves. And if, if they espouse our principles and our beliefs, go down and represent us in Albany. And so I started doing writings on this. And my my writings on this kind of took off and I presented across the state of New York and people came forward to me after this and said, why don't you give it a shot and see if you can take the words that you put on the paper and actually make them happen. And it was the right time. I heard a lot of things out in the public about change and I thought, okay, this is a good time for me. It's time, good time for my family. Uh, my children are all older and my instinct is to give back to my community and this is my way of doing it. So why challenge Janet Dupree, who was a sitting incumbent, uh, a part of the same Republican Party? Um, well, my thought there was that I had heard so much dissent or dissatisfaction from people that they really wanted things to operate differently at the state level. The thing is that I think a lot more people out there are, they know a lot more than we think that they know. And uh, what I was hearing from people is that the state is where we're going to be able to fix the state. We can't rely on the federal government to do that. So in, in creating a good, strong New York state that can stand up to the federal government and it's overreaching, you know, arms in it, what it is that we do every single day, um, you have to have good, strong people that will deliver your message to Albany. And a lot of the people that I was talking to felt that the message was really coming at them from Albany. And so we had great conversations about that and I thought, you know what, this is the right time. There seems to be dissatisfaction. This would be a great position for me. I think it's a good place for me to start and end because I'm not a career politician <laughs> and I don't want to make this a career. I'm at the end of my career. So I, I just thought the time was right, the, the people were right, the message was right, and it was just, it was the, it's just the appropriate time. And when you talk about your career, you're mm -hmm. a school teacher, Plattsburgh High School, a number of years. 26. 26, so yes. a long time educator. Right, I'm starting my 27th year this year, so. How much is education on your mind as far as priorities when you go, when you go to Albany if, if you're elected? Is that, is, is that at the top of the list or is the economy and jobs and, and <laughs> things like that? It's so funny that you say that because I think the politically correct answer from my, for my priorities would be jobs and the economy. But I think what you're going to find about this campaign is that we're anything but politically correct. So in saying that, I'm going to answer that, yes, education would be a priority. I also, however, the way that I think most people would think I would do it would be a little bit different. I'm an educator at heart. So I believe knowledge is power. So I believe a huge piece of this particular position is educating the electorate about what's happening in Albany. Mm. Not necessarily about education, although that would be a priority for me, but it's about communicating back to the people who put you in office so that they know everything that's going on in Albany. For example, 571 new pieces of legislation were passed this year. The Assembly was very proud of that because according to them, it was the fewest number of pieces of legislation since 1913. So I started thinking that through my mind and I'm thinking 571 pieces of legislation if we multiply that by the number of years that I am, okay, that's 29,000 pieces of legislation that have gone on the books just in my lifetime. So as an informed citizen and somebody who pays attention to local politics and state politics and national politics, I'm thinking, I don't know 
all of those pieces of legislation. So now I have to go and do all of the information, the research gathering, the analysis, the data, and try and figure out how those new pieces of legislation fit into my life. I really think it's the job of the assembly person to bring that information to you. So there's the education piece. I also, of course, feel very strongly about the state of education in New York and the fact that we're, we seem to be nationalizing our education system. So that would be a priority for me. Let me ask you about one of the bills that, uh, that did pass this past year, the mm -hmm. teacher evaluation system. Yes. You're not a big fan of it. I'm not. Not at all, as a matter of fact. I believe that the system needed to be overhauled, and I agree with that. I said, however, we went from doing little in the public eye to doing this enormous monster and bear that's going to take 10 hours per person to be to have an evaluation. How is that going to work with our administrators? How is that going to work with our teaching staff? How is it I'm going to prepare 96 different points that I'm going to be evaluated on over the course of the year and not have it get in the way of seeing students on my free periods, seeing students after school? That time has to come from someplace and, and if you have good qualified um, teachers who really care about what it is that they do, it's never going to come away from kids. So then it's going to come away from your family. You know, so how we're going to fit that in and make those changes, I'm not sure. I think they have to happen, but but what they put together, I think, is an enormous uh, bear. It seems system. the thorniest issue for many was whether or not to make it public, but you, there yes. are many more problems than just that. Absolutely many more. And I, I want to touch on the public issue, too. I don't think there's any other employee in the state of New York who would have their evaluation public to anybody but yet it would be for teachers. So, you know, I, I have a real problem with that. Even though I, I agree with the system needing, needing to be overhauled and whatnot, I don't believe that my evaluation should be available to people on the outside because nobody else's is. You know, so I think if we look at cleaning house, and may maybe look at some different things, for example, APPR, if it was done at a much smaller level, could actually replace the tenure system. And I think that's a huge plus for teachers because the tenure system is a problem with the public. Since we're talking about uh, education, mm -hmm. the property tax cap mm -hmm. passed and uh, now school districts and communities are dealing with it. Mm -hmm. A number of school districts are dipping into their reserves mm -hmm. to deal with it. They do have the power to override it, yep. but it has it in, in the early stages turned out to be good for communities or is this something that's truly handicapping school districts? I think that if you speak with teachers, you're going to hear one thing, and if you speak with taxpayers, you're going to hear another. But I like to think the teachers are taxpayers, so <laughs> we can come to common ground on this. I personally believe that the 2% tax cap was a 2% tax raise, because it gave you the ability to raise your taxes 2% every single year, whether you needed to or not. Now, I know Plattsburgh City School District suffered horribly this last time, because we were, I mean, we started out at a very high percentage. About 6%? Yes, it? but yeah. it was higher than that when it was in its inception. Hmm. And then they had it down to 6%, and then we lost the first round, and then we had to go back for the second. We were the only ones who did. Mm -hmm. um, so I think districts are, are leading, pro we're losing programs, we're losing electives. Um, what we're not losing, and we're losing teachers, but what we're not doing is shifting what it is we need to do in order to make, to make all of those things kind of work better for students. So we're forced to be put in a position now to, to have a 2% tax cap. I don't believe that that's a horrible thing. I, w I personally, I would like to see it as 0% tax cap. Tax. Taxes, yeah, people can't afford them anymore. And when you when you go out and you speak to people and you sit with the small groups of people like we've done, it's an enormous issue, school taxes, but it, it's an interesting issue because people will say they don't want their taxes raised, but then they will say they don't want their programs cut. And so we're having the hard conversation of, okay, how can you not raise your taxes and not cut programs? There has to be ingenuity there. And we've sat with principals, we've sat with CSEA members, bus drivers, and um, also uh, superintendents, and trying to figure out some way that the, we can clean up the system ourselves and it's really creative when you ask the people within the system how they can change the system for, for the betterment of all. So we're, we're having those conversations and it's been wonderful. Another big issue in Albany, minimum wage yes. did not pass, uh, uh, the votes aren't there uh, this time around. It may be one of those issues people say that uh, as the vote keeps coming up year after year that eventually it'll pass. What, what do you think of that? Should we raise the minimum wage or does it kill small business? I think it kills small business. I also think the problem is minimum wage was originally designed for entry-level positions and sadly what's ended up happening is a lot of people are using entry-level positions as a means of providing for their families mm -hmm. because we have a lack of jobs. So if you want to talk about job creation and growth that's a huge issue. I don't think that raising the minimum wage takes care of that problem. 
I think that we really need to attack the problem and leave minimum wage where it is because it will kill small businesses. Now, if you want to talk about job creation and growth, you have to talk, look at a variety of things. Um, everything that uh, everything that we've talked about with people out in the district has been interesting because if you start talking about Medicaid, that brings you back to job creation and growth. If you talk about education, it can lead you to drop job creation and growth. So it's very funny. I don't really want to call it job creation and growth. I want to talk about all of the obstacles that are keeping job creation and growth from happening and the criteria that New York State needs to embrace in order to have sustainable job creation and growth, which would happen if we clean up some of these extraneous issues that are happening on the outside that are affecting our ability to have good quality jobs and, and sustainable jobs. List a few of them. Though. List what, sure. what needs to be taken care of to, to help the job creation. Absolutely. Okay. First thing that we need to have is a good regulatory climate, a business friendly regulatory climate. The second thing we need to have is a predictable regulatory climate. I think a lot of businesses, small businesses, will tell you that they weren't moving forward and expanding because they didn't know what was going to happen next with the state. The third thing we should have is available funds from banks. For a while, banks froze up their funding for small businesses. So now you have a business that wants to move forward. They don't know if the regulation is going to be there, and now they don't know if they can access the funds. The next thing you need is a skilled workforce. If you don't have a skilled workforce to be able to handle the jobs that are coming in, they're not going to come in. And the last thing is, uh, is a climate that embraces technology and realizes that you need to move to point B and not necessarily stick on point A. And then the, the piece de resistance, I guess you could say, is lower taxes. So you put all of those things together. I think if you look at the Bush tax cuts, they didn't create sustainable job growth and development because it didn't embrace, the country was not at a point to embrace these other five concepts. So in just dropping taxes, we didn't create a good sustainable job growth because you have to address these other issues. Tax is obviously a big issue. Many of the communities will say, we can't cut taxes. We have all these mandates, a number of unfunded mandates from the state. We, we can't afford to, to lower prices. In fact, our prices are going, are skyrocketing every year for pensions and health care. Mm -hmm. We just sat with the Cumberland Head t uh, Taxpayers Association on Thursday night. In fact, the Press Republican reported on that event, and that was an enormous issue. Pension reform was a huge topic, taxes and Medicaid reform. So what I want to speak to, I guess, is the whole let's let's just tackle Medicaid for a minute. Uh, Fifty-five percent of Clinton County's budget is Medicaid driven. If you look at St. Lawrence County, theirs is at almost fifty-five percent, and Franklin County is over fifty-five percent. Mm -hmm. So I've sat with the county manager of St. Lawrence County. I've spoken with the county administrator of, of Clinton County, and we've spoken with the county manager in Franklin County. Huge tax burden is a, is a direct result of Medicaid. Now, now I'm going to talk about something else because, again, remember I said all of these things are interconnected. Mm -hmm. So now I want to talk about the Regional Economic Development Grant process that we just went through, okay? Mm -hmm. $870 million infiltrated into the economy, which was an identical program to the failed Obama stimulus plan that happened at the federal level. So now we have $870 million being thrown in there. We have county governments which are stifled underneath this enormous Medicaid tax burden. Let's just say the state decided to take that $870 million, divide by 62 counties evenly for $14.7 million per county and allow those counties to put that money into Medicaid relief. Okay, now on top of that, we talk about some really tough decisions that need to happen with Medicaid. So at the same time, we're relieving property tax owners with their Medicaid bill to the tune of $14.7 million, roughly. Okay, now you turn around and you talk about doing a couple of different things. You can do some baby steps with Medicaid and you can do some giant leaps with Medicaid. One baby step. Uh, you have to be a resident of the state of New York for one year before you get Medicaid. That's going to keep people from coming into our state because we offer the Cadillac of Medicaid programs. In St. Lawrence County, they have a family that commuted here from California to receive just me their Medicaid. Okay, and California is the second state in the nation behind New York, but they only offer half of what we offer. So there's a baby step right there would probably keep people from joining our state for the purposes of getting monies that our ta the people who have paid our taxes can afford them giant step you want to take, let's just offer what the federal government mandates that we offer and not offer the Cadillac program that New York State has. And at the same time, try to entice businesses because now you can decrease your Medicaid bill, now your property taxes go down, you embrace those five other things that I talked about, maybe some businesses will walk into the state. And if we also talk about New York State changing to a right to work state, now you've got a healthy climate for business growth and development. So again, all of these things are interrelated. So I can't say one of them is a priority because they each piggyback off each other. So you would use that money for Medicaid instead of the, the regional competition where the 10 regions competed for I economic development once. money. Let, let's just do it once. Let's just take that $870 million once and do it. You know, I have a real problem paying $10 million to um, reconstruct a 34-mile piece of railway to an abandoned paper mill. 
that was in the paper this week also. You know, that was just $10 million. $10 million, million the, dollars. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and that's just one small thing. And then I'll take you back. You were at my announcement, the chicken plucker truck, okay? Let me give you a phase two of the chicken plucker truck. $175,000. They actually bought the truck, but now the FDA has put its stipulations on them with the actual business that they're supposed to attach to the truck. So now you have a small business that's purchased this truck and isn't even using it for the purposes of their small business. So this is out of the economic development yes. money. This is a portable chicken slaughtering Devi truck yes, that requires that, 100 that goes from chickens. farm to farm. Yeah, requires uh, 100 chickens. So that farmers can, can slaughter their chickens. Right, and it failed in the state of Vermont, uh, but we allowed it to happen in the state of New York. And these are just small examples, but if you are extrapolate that. But are there success stories, like the Bombardier money, the, the two and a half million for Bombardier, they just announced uh, that, that they're going ahead with their expansion. So are there, are there some success stories that come out of that uh, development money? I think you're always going to find some success stories. However, if you look at it from a different perspective, Bombardier, and when I was a kid growing up, and even when I was a young adult, businesses went to the bank for expansion. The bank has now become New York State. Okay. Now, Bombardier has their own personal investment in this, so it's a little bit different. But let's talk about the housing crisis that happened in the federal government. Why is it that that happened? It happened because we gave people the ability to purchase homes at 100% of their value. We paid for all of it. They didn't have to put any money down. Two years later, or three years later, or a year later, they were able to walk away from those properties because they had no investment in, in, in the house in the first place. That's what's happened with many of these grants, too. And, and the piece that, that I find very curious is, when are we going to get a report back on this? And when are we going to know how that $870 million was actually used and how successful it actually was? And in the report back, now we've created another layer of bureaucracy, which means we're going to have to pay for that report back. So I guess what I'm saying is that if businesses used old-fashioned methods and actually went to a bank, invested in their own properties, that would be a wonderful thing. One of the projects that many people brought up mm -hmm. for the first round of the economic development money that, that was deemed not to be shovel-ready mm -hmm. is the rooftop highway. Mm -hmm. Uh, where do you come down on that? Is that a is that a project that w is is needed and would boost the economy across northern New York? Do you keep it as a four lane interstate? Do you look at just expanding Route 11, or is it a boondoggle? Either way. Well, I tell you what, we've traveled Route 11 to the tune of about 10,000 miles in the last three months. So <laughs> I could speak yeah. about the problems of the it, Route 11 it corridor. Covers, yeah. Yes, the entire 115th. Yeah. I have, I have. But we've met with fire departments and we've met with, uh, we've toured different facilities and we've met with small coalition groups, which was basically what we've done for the last seven months. And I asked them this question. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to hear from the people who are actually living in those towns how they felt about it. And it is absolutely a polarizing. Uh, conversation. Yeah. You have people who believe that the towns that are there right now will die if the rooftop highway goes in because the only people stopping there now are people who are en route to wherever it is that they're going. And anybody can, this is, and it's funny because somebody said to me, you know, people can wait two hours before they have to stop and go to the bathroom if there's a highway. You know, but they don't. They tend to stop and go into right. a mom and pop shop or Bob's Music and Gun Shop, you know, which is right on Route 11. So I think that the people haven't really decided where they stand on this issue yet. And a lot of what we've done with this campaign is trying to craft a message for the people that we're listening to. So I don't have I don't have a stand on that yet. Hydrofracking, though, mm -hmm. you you mm -hmm. do have a stand on that. Mm -hmm. uh, you you believe that New York needs to get going on hydrofracking. I believe that it doesn't affect the 115th Assembly District. And as True. a result of it not affecting the 115th Assembly District, and I'm going to carry this one step further, as a result of it not affecting the 115th Assembly District, I don't really want to have that much of a say in what happens. We believe that the federal government already has a to whole bunch of regulation with regard to hydrofracking. So if an individual community wants to take on that situation, that that particular community should take a look at whatever regulations it needs. And so I'm going to streamline that into my a conversation about what's happening with the overreaching hands of the state government of the state of New York. Those 571 pieces of legislation that were passed, 125 of them have actually gone across the desk of the governor. We have a team that analyzes all of that legislation. What we found through that analysis is that repeatedly the State Assembly and the Senate are being asked to vote on regional issues. Issues that do not affect the entire state of New York. Issues that are incredibly geographic. And I'll give you an example. For example, there was a police officer down in Suffolk County and there was a pension issue with him. They voted on that in the State Assembly to reinstate his pension. That's a regional issue. 
that's a county-based issue or even a town-based issue, but it came across the floor of the assembly, which means it had to be voted on, it had to be, it had to go through a committee, okay, now it's being written into legislation. So I think that we, we're trying to take all of these different regions, and, and New York is so diverse, it's so eclectic, you know, we're, 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 we have all this grandeur and it looks so different, and people from downstate are legislating what happens in our neck of the woods, outdoor wood boilers. People in the Bronx have absolutely nothing to do with outdoor wood boilers, yet they're voting on that. You know, so I have a huge problem with the overreaching arm of the, of the state government, and I think that it clearly shows itself in hydrofracking, in wood boilers, in upping our license fees for hunting, in closing our prisons. I mean, it just, it, it's extrapolating itself through our entire way of life and our culture, and, and I believe that that's wrong. Let's talk social issues. Sure. Um, gay marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, Janet Dupree voted in favor of it. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you stand on that? I would have voted against that. I believe the traditional, the, ma the definition of marriage is between a man and a woman. Do you think that there is vast unhappiness within the assembly district, the, the way she voted? Do you think the majority of people in this assembly district do not support her on that? Can I, can I say that in a word? Yes. And the reason I say that is because I'm traveling. I'm, uh, we've been everywhere. We've been throughout all three counties. We've been listening to people. We've been going door to door. And that's what people tell me. So a lot of what I create, the priority list that I've come up with, that, that I've just discussed with you, it's not mine. It's the priority of the people. You know, what we did, we committed on February 15th to visit as many of the 130,000 people in this district. You were there that day. I spent the last seven months as a businesswoman and as a teacher working while doing this. We've been to 75 separate events. We've gone from community events to actually sitting with county managers to, to government to listening to county legislators to touring facilities. We're trying to do the job so that when we hit the ground running, we know what the job looks like. People are telling me these things. And so my whole premise of my campaign was to redirect the message, and that's what we've been doing. You picked up a big endorsement in, in the past couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug Hoffman, who's yes. certainly well known, uh, was the Conservative Party candidate uh, for Congress mm -hmm. uh, two times, endorsed you. How mm -hmm. big of a, of a deal is that for you to, to get his endorsement? Personally, it was huge. Doug is a good friend of mine. I think if there, there is nobody out there in the arena right now who understands what it's like to walk out of your private life into a very public forum to put a jersey on, which is, for me, the taxpayer jersey, walk out on the field with shoulder pads and take a hit every single day. <laughs> Doug Hoffman knows what that feels like, so he's been a tremendous mentor for me, and, and we, we do have similar stories. I'm an educator, he's an accountant, but we both are leaving our private lives. We're not politicians, and stepping out to do community service, and it's, it's a tough road. You are the Conservative Party nominee as well. Uh, you are running in the Republican primary here. Uh, regardless, you already have that nomination mm -hmm. sewn up. So if you do not win the Republican primary, you are staying in the race. Yes, but I think another important question would be if Janet doesn't run the, win the Republican primary, will she, sh will she stay in the race? Because she has an additional line as well. Independence Party? Yes. Okay, so we could be looking at a three-way race, mm -hmm. uh, possibly coming up in November. Mm -hmm. Republicans, some Republicans will cringe when you say that because they saw what happened in the congressional mm -hmm. race where they believe that having two candidates, mm -hmm. or three candidates to the right may have cost them mm -hmm. that election. Right. So some people may say, do you stay in the race at the risk of costing the Republicans the, the seat in the assembly? I look at it differently. We're in an incredibly difficult primary season because this is our third primary. So um, we've only had 5%, 5 to 6% turnout in the congressional primary in June. We're not exactly sure what to expect in the September Thursday, September 13th primary. Right. I'm sure to say that Thursday. Um, so, you know, f the primary is designed to pick your candidate for your party. However, we're going to hopefully have, you know, greater than 50% of the people show up on November 6th. So I do believe that there is, from everything that I've heard and all of the places that I've been and all of the information that people are giving me, I do believe that there's a possibility to be able to take this race from a third party line. And how tough is that to have the primary because of September 11th mm -hmm. being on Tuesday? Mm -hmm. Legislature voted back in June to move primary day to Thursday, September right. 13th, as you mentioned. How much does that make it, uh, how tougher does that make it for the candidates uh, mm -hmm. to, to get people motivated to get out to the polls? Because that's out of their comfort zone. Uh, they're not used to voting on a Thursday. Right, and it's unfamiliar. But I think if you as a candidate continue to be right in there in the game, 
play in the game every single day, which is what we're doing. We have events every day. We're out door to door every day. So we're trying, and we're sending out literature. So if you do all of those things and you stay in the game and you don't sit back in your home or sit back on your laurels and, and, and you, you stay active in what it is you're supposed to be doing, this race ends on November 6th. I don't stop until November 6th. So hopefully I will tackle that and, 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 and draw on people who maybe didn't vote in the last primary at the same time. So that's the goal. So we just keep moving ahead and moving ahead and every night we hit 20 and we hit 20 and that's what we do. So. Now some people may remember you were campaign manager for David Kimmel who mm -hmm. was also in the race mm -hmm. so they would probably wonder why are you challenging uh, Dave Kimmel who is your uh, who you worked for two years ago and who many people already see potentially to the right of, of Janet. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let me explain it this way. First of all, Dave Kimmel is challenging me because I jumped into the race before he did. Okay. <laughs> so I'll we'll just clarify that. <laughs> Chronologically. <laughs> Chronologically, yes. that's all exactly right. where it is. Um, and we also, I left that campaign after about four months. Um, Doug, at the time, came in and asked me to help him out, which I did. Uh, Dave and I, w we differ on a variety of issues. And I think that we present as two different candidates and we present in two different directions. So there's a clear difference between us, just as there's a clear difference between myself and Janet. So I think that people, ha it's, you can't lose when people have choice. You know, when primary voters have p somebody to pick from, that's, that's the system at, at its greatest. Well, let's pick up on that. We talked sure. about maybe how you differ from Jenna. How mm -hmm. do you differ from David? What are the issues that you differ on? Mm -hmm. uh, one major issue that we differ on is that he's created a five-point plan that he's created. I've created a plan that's come from the people. That's an enormous difference. I have worked my tail off for the last seven months. I have been in all three counties to over 75 events. We've sat and listened to people. We've asked the questions. I haven't sat in my house and created a plan. I've gone out and listened to people and created a plan. I think that's an enormous difference between us. Karen Bissow, thank you very much for taking the time thank to come so by. Thank you so much, Tom. Stuff. It was a pleasure. I appreciate it.